Now it's finally time for the last step, and that's determining the right charge controller for your needs. As usual, a little history first. My first charge controller was 24 volt, 30 amp, and I don't even remember who made it. I do remember that it worked well, and it had a relay that wore out after a couple of years. The next one was a load diversion type that could handle up to 75 amps. It used MOSFET transistors, which is a very efficient type of switching transistor. Most inverters use these type of transistors. This charge controller required a DC load dump to operate. The way it worked was this. As the voltage rose on the batteries, it started off switching the load on and off very fast, giving the impression that the load was drawing a small amount of average current or average amperage. As the voltage continued to rise, the controller would dump more and more amps into the load until it was just on continuously. This charge controller worked great, but it had a couple of nasty drawbacks. First of all, a 24 volt DC load that draws 75 amps is almost impossible to find, but it did give me a good introduction into the glories of heating water for energy storage. The other drawback is very few things can handle pulsed power so I was limited to certain motors and anything that could generate heat. I chose hot water because I could store it for periods of time. If the fuse to my load dump ever blew, then my batteries would just boil themselves dry. Now I have a Xantrex MPPT60 that can handle any voltage from 12 to 60 volts and amperage all the way up to 60 amps. It's very flexible and very programmable. And a point I want to make here is that if you can only afford a certain voltage or a level of equipment, it's still better than nothing. It's kind of like a motorcycle club. It's not so much that you've got the biggest and grooviest looking bike, but more important that you're part of the game. Alternative energy is the same way. As long as you're in the game as much as you can, you're still part of the family. So don't worry about getting the biggest or best, just get what you can. Now for selecting the right charge controller. Of course you need one that's rated for the voltage of your system, so you need to concentrate on the number of amps that that charge controller can handle. The controller should handle at least the same number of amps as your panels or the wind generator can output at a short circuit. At any rate, you should have a fuse or a breaker that will kill the power if the amps reaches the limit of your charge controller. As a side note, Square D's QO series of breakers are rated good for DC up to 48 volts. It has to be the QO series and not the home line series. Most of the time it will cost no more than a large fuse holder and a fuse that's rated for DC. And you can use them as a switch to turn your panels off to the charger to make wiring changes. I use Square D QO series breakers throughout my system. I know they work because I have tripped a 15 amp breaker a few times and I had to change my wiring and the breaker to handle 20 amps to cure the problem. So selecting a charge controller is pretty straightforward and you can get a plain vanilla style that will keep your batteries where they need to be. If you have a plain vanilla type you'll need to equalize your batteries at least every two months by bypassing your charger for a couple of days and keeping your eye on your battery voltage. I'll make a video on battery maintenance later but it, that's not covered in this series. Some charge controllers have an equalize button or a switch on them so you don't have to be quite as proactive about it. Some charge controllers are programmable and that's where things can get hairy pretty quick because of all the options that bloom out of microprocessor controlled equipment. And charge controllers are no exception. Some people have a fear of the microprocessor stuff, but as an old design engineer, I can tell you that the technology has come a long way thanks to space and military research. Most integrated circuits and circuit boards have components that harden the equipment against radiation EMP, gamma rays, and other such stuff. Now the kind of EMP that some people fear the sun will throw at us one day or that could be man-made is another story. I've never seen that level of EMF anywhere, but I know that my inverter and charge controller have easily survived many a thunderstorm on my mountaintop, and that's good enough for me. The key for survivability in general terms is good system grounding. Now about my Xantrex MPPT-60 and the main reason why I chose it. The main reason was its flexibility, but it's good for battery systems from 12 volts all the way up to 60 volts. That means it'll grow with you. It will convert PV and wind generator input up to 130 volts DC 
and down convert it to your battery voltage. This is fantastic in that it allows you to put your PV panels or wind generator long distances from your battery and point of use by using much smaller wire. The higher voltage is what allows the runs to be longer and the charge controller only needs about 10 watts of power for operating overhead. That is absolutely phenomenal. Watch this video clip. As you can see, the sky is very overcast and there are no shadows being cast around the house or the trees. What is so fantastic for me is that there is another advantage to having the PV voltage higher. During cloudy weather, the charge controller gives us as much as 50% more power than if the panels were wired at the same voltage as the batteries. The reason for this is in this chart. The panels will always put out near the same voltage as their open circuit rating. It's the amps that suffer, so as a result the overall wattage output suffers. But when you have them wired in series, the net converted power is higher because the charge controller will automatically pick the highest power curve output for the panels, seeking just the right combination of volts and amps to get the most wattage. For example, in cloudy weather, my panels will put out 15 amps at a 60 volt input into the charger. But if I had them wired for the same voltage as the batteries, I would only be getting 10 amps of power. The 50% increase in usable power means that our batteries get almost fully charged even on cloudy days. Another reason I chose it is because it handles up to 60 amps, in or out. It tapers the charge so that your batteries get the right kind of charge. It's also programmable for virtually any type of battery. It also has a programmable switch. You can program it to throw the switch on or off on a voltage level you decide and program it to switch the other way on another voltage level. You can even have it switch on a certain temperature or if it has a fault alarm. What's even better is you can even pick a voltage that the switch will put out anywhere from 5 to 13 volts. I use mine to turn on the 240 volt solid state relay that turns the water heater on and off. This way I'm maximizing the use of every possible watt that my panels generate. When the battery voltage rises the water heater turns on. If it's early morning and the panels are only putting out say 25 amps and the water heater kicks on the voltage starts to go down until it kicks back off. As the batteries get more and more charged the water heater turns on and off more frequently. No it doesn't hurt the water heater because the solid state relay is doing the switching not the water heater. The water heater just simply shuts off when the water is hot and when that happens the charge controller just does its job by continuing to regulate the voltage. Now at noon when we're getting the full 60 amps from the charger the water heater just comes on and stays on because it is only drawing 50 amps. The other 10 amps are going to the batteries for charging. When the wife fires up the stove that will pull another 20 to 45 amps. Now the voltage starts to go down again but then the water heater just shuts off and the stove continues to run. So it's the water heater that simply acts as a shock absorber. It takes up the slack of any leftover power so there's never any power at all wasted. All excess power goes to heat water instead of just going nowhere at all. The whole setup just works so much better than I'd even expected. You can also stack these chargers via their network interface so they all work together to keep your batteries charged. You can have one that handles a couple of wind generators and another that handles all your panels. Voltage compensated to give your batteries the right charge based on temperatures. A battery's amp hour capacity is affected by temperature. Your battery will actually feel a bit smaller in winter than it does in the summer. Well that does it for the primer series. As you can see all we did was just cover planning and nothing else about installation or maintenance of any of your system. Those will be covered in later video series. Have a great week and thank you for watching. Don't forget to leave a comment and hit that subscribe button if you haven't done so already. Thank you.